Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Today on the Focus on Why podcast, I am joined by Imogen Edwards-Jones. Welcome, Imogen. Hello, how are you? I'm really well, thank you. And just to give some context to the audience, I missed you this summer. I know, well, we are related. That's that's what, yes, <laughs> yes, I missed you too this summer. <laughs> it's such I, a shame. I've been a very short period of time, sadly. Yeah, so just to give some context, we normally meet up in the summer because we have parents who live very close to each other in France. So it's a great opportunity to catch up with all of the family and the cousins. So didn't do it. So here we are. I'm using this as an opportunity to have a catch up with you instead. Oh, I know. It was very sad. My favourite times when we do that is when we play um, uh, rounders. Do you remember? Well, Because your family is all very athletic. <laughs> Mine are not. So you guys whack it all over the place and the rest of us are sort of sitting around drinking too much wine thinking, oh God, have I got to go and pick that up? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's 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 really good fun with lots of space and also, you know, managed to play a bit of croquet as well, which is great, yeah, great yeah. fun. Yeah. Another year, another, another, hopefully not another not lockdown year. So we should yes. be all good next, next summer. So let's crack on and I'm just going to ask you, what is it you're doing at the moment? I am, I've got three books on the go at the moment, which is quite hard to do. So I'm writing a sort of satirical novel about a woman on the verge of a nervous breakdown, which is, it sounds like non-fiction, but it's actually fiction. Um, uh, And that's been published by Welbeck. Uh, It's the first time I've been published by them, actually. Uh, And it's called If You've Got Anything Stronger. And the second thing I'm doing is I'm writing a follow-up to, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Witches of St. Petersburg, which was about black magic in the the Russian court uh, and Rasputin and the demise of the Romanovs. And uh, this is called The Witch's Daughter and it's historical fiction and it's the follow-up to that, which is great, I'm hoping. And uh, the third one is I'm ghosting for I'm ghosting a biography for somebody so I do quite a lot of ghosting on the sly it's uh it's one of those sort of guilty secrets that the world of publishing has where some famous people pretend to have written a book and invariably it's somebody like me who's been typing away for a year or so and then you hear them on the today program saying I mean I can't believe I I mean I, I almost felt like I didn't write this book and I'm sitting there thinking, I know, because you didn't. I did. <laughs> but you do get cast asunder as soon as the uh, the book is finished, like some, you know, filthy, guilty secret. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I'm doing one of those. So three books on the go at the same time, which mm. is a huge achievement. Most people struggle just to pen one at a time, but three, and three completely different books here. Yes, it's better that they're completely different and it depends on my mood as to as to what I feel like doing that day I mean to be honest with you I haven't done the Russian one for a bit but mainly because I've got to do the the uh, sort of satirical uh, novel and that's got to be in, in in about five weeks so I'm head down doing that mainly but uh, if I'm feeling a little bit so uh, creatively exhausted then I will actually do, uh, I'll do the uh, biography because that's a lot easier. That's just basically putting pieces of a jigsaw puzzle together. And it's interesting that you talk about how you are cast asunder after writing something like that because it's a big part of of you. It's a big part of being a creative writer anyway. Mm. How does it feel to sort of then just sort of give it away? Give away your baby. Uh, it's a very weird feeling. Um, you get you get quite possessive about it, but then you you know I I mean I've I've done so many of them now that I'm uh, I'm a lot more used to it. But yes, you do get quite cross actually. <laughs> and also, if they don't thank you, then you get even more cross. 
And then the other thing is you've got to be very careful what sort of contract you have if, you, if you're doing this. Because it is basically uh, for money, the job. Uh, but also you need to realise that if the book does well and it goes top 10, which I've had a few of them do, what you want to do is make sure that you are actually, you'd still have skin in the game because there is nothing worse than watching a book that you spent, you know, a year writing, then suddenly doing well, and then you then you don't get any extra money for it. And it's, that is a one-way ticket to total and utter bitterness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So let's go into the St. Petersburg area, the the Russian area of your literature, which is, I mean, tell us more about how that originated. Well, um, my degree is in Russian, so I I speak Russian. I studied it at Bristol University and I I loved it. It was the most eye-opening, magical uh, four years of my life and I was lucky enough to study some of the best uh, writers with the best professors. So I had the authority on Chekhov in the world teaching me and the authority on Tolstoy teaching me. And it was a magic period of my life and I really loved it. And I am so old, I went to Kiev University in my year abroad because it was still part of the Soviet Union. That's how old I am because the Ukraine was still, you know, attached to the Soviet Union uh, and it was under Gorbachev. And I do remember sitting in my class in in Kiev with the teacher trying to persuade us that the birthmark that Gorbachev had, if you remember, he had that sort of tomato ketchup sort of stain on the front of his, on his forehead, uh, was actually on the back of his head because in all the official photographs, well, they weren't really, there were some drawings, I suppose, uh, of Gorbachev, they'd actually erased the uh, birthmark. So I remember having a proper argument with them about that. Yes, and so then I um, spent quite a lot of time in Russia, and I was lucky enough to be sent to Russia, uh, Soviet Union still as it was then, to write my first ever book, which I had published when I was 23, which was uh, about the first 100 days of the collapse of communism. And I was sent by the then editor of the Mail on Sunday. He's no longer with us now. Sadly, Stuart Stephen, who was a legendary editor and incredibly uh, dynamic and exciting. And he sent me to Russia. So I went to from St. Petersburg right the way travelled all the way through the whole of the collapsing Soviet Union, right the way through to Sakhalin, which is an island just above Japan. And I went through all the, uh, all the, now they're now countries, but all they were then states, uh, and, and catalogued the, the fall of uh, an empire. And uh, I always thought it was because I was incredibly talented and marvellous and everything. And then a few years afterwards, I said to him, why did you send me to to do this incredible book uh, and have this incredible experience. And he said, uh, because you were cheap and keen. (laughs) And I just thought, wow, I am cheap and keen. (laughs) And I think that is uh, a good thing to be when you're young, cheap and keen. Uh, And uh, uh, yes, so as a result, anyways, as a result, I still have a, I've had a, a love affair with that country for a very, very long time. And I came across this incredible story about these two women. They were sisters from Montenegro. They were princesses from Montenegro um, who married into the Russian court. And they were obsessed with the occult and black magic. And they were the women who brought Rasputin into the court. And, you know, that is obviously a brilliant beginning for a story. And it's interesting because you mentioned magic several times talking about studying Russian and yet yeah. now you're talking about actual magic in your books. Yes, well, I, I do think it's a magical place. I and mean, I do remember um, some a lovely friend of mine who's an artist uh, in Kiev saying to me years ago, you know, this country has taken your soul and uh, and you will always come back here. And I think that's true. So I've only ever been to Moscow. I'd love to go to St. Petersburg. But what struck me in, in Moscow was the the grand tube stations that they have. They're like ballrooms. I know. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. They do nothing by, nothing in half, by half, I think. 
everything in in that country is big bold and you know extreme it is a country of extremes and i think you know if you're sort of remotely dramatically inclined which i probably am i think it, it speaks to you there's nothing mediocre there at all you know it's either very very hot or very very cold you know there's they you know they're getting they drink too much they laugh they cry i mean it is it's a very dramatic place and i think the architecture like you know i mean you know why build a normal tube station where you can have a ballroom <laughs> absolutely so dramatically inclined and you're saying that it, the russia speaks to you mm. do your books speak to you oh that's a very interesting question um yeah. It's very difficult because writing is a is a very 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 boring process. <laughs> I always used to say that I'm not rich enough to have writer's block, so you have to uh, you. Uh, it's all a back question about sitting and waiting for the muse, but you have to do the sitting because the muse doesn't just turn up. You really have to do the sitting. So if you're if you're if you're thinking that um, you know that you, you can just pop in and write a couple of thousand words and then pop out again that's just not possible but I think there there is an idea that you actually sort of channel the book that you're writing so if you've if you're in the right place and it's going it's called what's it called um flow I think that's what it's called in um uh in in mindfulness terms when you reach flow which is you know if you row I know you you love rowing. If you row down a river and you reach that sort of sort of magical sort of nadir where you're you are you're not thinking and it's reflex and and suddenly half an hour's passed and you don't even know where you've been. That's what happens when you're when you're really writing and it's really working and you go deaf, you can't hear the doorbell or and when people interrupt you it's really frustrating because you it takes a while to get into flow but there are some people who believe and I sort of slightly think it's true that you end up sort of channeling your book that your book is already fully formed somewhere in the ether and if you're lucky enough to latch onto that balloon as it were and drag it down to earth then suddenly it actually works but you know it's it's very boring hard work sitting waiting and thinking and hoping that uh, that it's going to happen it's really interesting that you say it's boring I, I mean I, I do generally find that really interesting I've just finished reading Stephen King's on writing the memoir of the oh, craft yes. of fabulous book and you saying about channeling the book isn't that the sort of like the Elizabeth Gilbert way that that the book's within you and if it's not within you it'll move to someone else yes yeah yeah absolutely but it is that sort of weird thing and sometimes you're a spectator in your own mind so you are basically just recording what's being uh, played out in your in your head if you see what I mean so uh yeah but that's when it's really working you know a lot of the time it is sort of it's as painful as pulling nasal hair I mean it's that's that's what it's like but I imagine I haven't read Stephen King. What's the, what's that? What does he say? It's boring and hard work. No, no. Well, he he loves it. He, it's his whole way of being, and he loves it. And he will literally just put himself into the office. He has a door closed policy or a door open policy, and that kind of is if the door's closed, you do not interrupt at all because you're in this fantastic flow state. The sort of the Mahali six center Mahali state that he he sort of analysed there. Mm. It's it's really interesting that you're saying that you're a spectator in your own mind, that you you do find it boring and that it, it can be painful. Mm. But do you love it when you finished? Or do you love, is there a point? Yeah. Of course. I mean, you know, when it's, I mean, the, the high you get when you've had a good day and it's worked and you're, it's, you know, six, I write very, very much like it's an office job. You know, there are some people who, who wake up at four o'clock in the morning and write before they do something else. Or people, there are some people who are, uh, who I think are, and what they call like spectator writers. So they so they like they like being watched while they're writing. So I've got various girlfriend writers who like writing in cafes. I couldn't think of anything worse. The idea that you're sitting there drinking your, you know, you're in your Starbucks and there are there's hustle and bustle and people running around you. I wouldn't be able to do that at all. So I'm very much the sort of person who sits in the office and I work from nine till six. That's it. 
occasionally I go a bit, uh, you know, if it's really working. But there are certain periods of the day when you, where where you get where flow is easier. Weirdly, I'm a sort of late afternoon writer. I think it's almost like guilt. I've messed around with the whole day, and then suddenly between three and six, boom! I have to, I do this thing where I have to do two thousand words a day because you can faff around writing a book, and it, so many people say, "Oh, I'm writing a novel," and I go, "Well, that's great. How far are you into it? You know, ten thousand words or whatever it is." And most people don't get beyond that. And what you have to do is finish it because then you have something because the playing around afterwards is the really fun bit, but you can't play around until you've finished it. So I always think you have to set yourself a word count. You have to hit that word count, whether it's crap or not, it doesn't really matter. So you've done your 2000 words today or what, your thousand or even 500 Graham Greene, I think, used to do 500 words a day and then ha- pour himself a martini. And he was allowed the martini, even if he'd done his 500 words by 10.30 in the morning. That was his That was his thing. So I think you have to set yourself a work hand and you have to do it because otherwise you have nothing. And did you see yourself as a writer? Yes, I've always done that, always. Uh, I, w- I went straight into journalism uh, after university so I went straight on to, uh, I, I, I won a writing competition, bizarrely. So do enter a competition if you see one, because they make a difference. <laughs> so I won um, the uh, Independent Writing Scholarship, which is put up by the Independent Newspaper when it had lots of money, you know, in the last century. <laughs> and, uh, and they paid for me to do uh, a postgrad in journalism. So I went straight from Russian into journalism. And then part of the prize was six months on the news desk, after which I was fired, actually. (laughs) I was fired by them. Uh, And then I went to Russia and wrote that that book and then came back. And then they rehired me as a columnist. So I think think they, uh, they did like me after all. Maybe not. <laughs> so I loved your loved your sort of thro- uh, throwaway comment, which was that you're not rich enough to have writer's block. Yes. But you, ha- you have done well with your writing. Yeah, yes. No, I've had a few hits. Yes, I have. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, the most, the big one that you probably know is uh, Hotel Babylon. Yeah. That was a life changer, actually. They don't come, a- they don't come around very often, those ones that really change your life. And it was made into a TV series by the BBC with the handsome Max Beasley. And yes, and then it spawned a great big series of them. So I did Beach Babylon, Air Babylon, Fashion Babylon. I went through all the industries. And that was a a really great period of my life. I I loved it. It was great fun. And uh, yes, so I did actually make some money then. (laughs) And, and with the idea of the Babylonian series, where did where did the origination come from? Well, originally, I met this guy who was uh, the manager of a five star hotel in London, and he wanted me to ghost. There you go, ghost. He wanted me to ghost his biography, and I was listening to his stories and thinking, yeah, your stories are great, but you yourself aren't very interesting uh but your stories are brilliant because he'd spent 20 years uh, you know at the cold face of hospitality so he had the best stories and at that particular time you're probably too young to remember this there was a brilliant uh, television series called 24 uh which was sort of a terrorist series and it was uh but it was set in a 24 it was 24 episodes And each episode was an hour long and it was a very, very, very good conceit for uh, a show. And I thought, so if we put 20 years of of experience in hotels into 24 hours into a hotel, that would give it some sort of pace and a sort of its own internal dynamism for, for the, for the book. And so that's what I did. So I took all his stories and made it into 24 hours uh, of a hotel. And it was a fictitious hotel. And he was a fictitious person. He was actually, the the original source was a manager, but I made him, put him on the front desk 
in reception because that was that was where you had the biggest uh, possibility of meeting people and doing different things. You see what I mean? So actually, uh, yeah. So that's how it started, and then um, and then so the night when I did Beach Babylon, which was about the resorts, which is a bit like uh, this new TV series called White Lotus that everyone's talking about at the moment. I put that into a week because most people go and stay for a week in a hotel, uh, one of those beach resort hotels. So that's how it started. And then um, with fashion, I did six months. But it was a very good way of giving um, a bit of momentum to uh, to the book. Well, thank you for saying that I'm too young to remember 24. I'm not, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I do remember the Kiefer Sutherland series. It's great. Yeah, yeah. But but going back to the the three books that you've got on the go at the moment and that you are flitting between the three of them and for, for different reasons obviously you've got the deadline in five weeks time which is yeah. no mean feat to finish that let's talk a little bit more about the fact that you are writing a satirical novel have you got anything stronger what are we likely to expect from this but it's supposed to be it's a woman on the verge of a nervous breakdown and it is it's basically the idea about being uh, 50 something and realizing that this is it and the idea that you thought you could would do this or you were going to do that or you know I've married this person I've got these children feminism has slightly sold you a bit of a dud you can't really have it all and when you try and have it all it's exhausting and what is all anyway it's a slightly sort of Nora Ephron I'm hoping idea of a sort of dry look at at what happened to feminism over the last 30 years because I was born in 1967 which was the year of the equal opportunities uh bill and uh yeah uh and so this is what I, that it's my feelings about where we are now but it's supposed to be funny I'm hoping it is anyway it's supposed to make me laugh it's almost autobiographical. Well, yeah, it is, but it's not really because uh, because if it were autobiographical, it'd be much worse. <laughs> and I think you said it was oh, it was it is fiction, but it, it teeters on the non-fiction element as well. It does teeter on the non-fiction, yes. But I mean, obviously, because you're if you're a writer, then you, you, most of your well, your entire job really is observation, and so you should really be listening, watching, picking up stories. You know, think finding jokes, you know, all these sort of good things, working out uh, scenarios. I mean, for example, and this isn't funny, but it actually is. Uh, a girlfriend of mine, her husband was run over the other day and uh, by a truck on his bicycle. And he suffered memory loss and all of this. And, you know, he's broken loads of bones and, and it's really awful. And then she says to me, <laughs> she said, and the one thing that he can remember, the one thing that he can remember, and I said, what? He went, is that he's bloody vegan. <laughs> I was just thinking, that's just genius. The idea that, I mean, he's actually fine now, just in case you're worried, but he's totally fine. But for the first couple of weeks, he couldn't really remember very much at all. All he could remember was that he was vegan. And she was desperate for him not to be vegan because it was so annoying and complicating for her. Anyway. So those are the sort of things that you have to listen and then you think, OK, that's actually quite funny. So I've got to work that into something else or uh, make, you know, you know, you just you've got to listen and and find turns of phrases and find stories and things. And then you store them in your great big suitcase in your head. And hopefully one day they are useful and you can cobble them together in a story. So this book actually lends itself really well to focus on why, because she's asking the question, is this it essentially? Yes. And you know, what is the purpose of my life? What is happening? What is the purpose of your life? And and is this it for you? I know. Well, probably. I mean, you know, there is no plan B, is there? Yeah, you've got to live in your A plan. So uh, yeah, it's a very difficult question to answer. And also, you know, are these the plans that you would have had when you were? 21 writing to your future self you know I mean are there regrets of stuff I've done yet I'm sure thousands but uh, I think 
you have to, uh, yeah, just keep keep your head up and keep going. I mean, there really isn't. This this is probably actually it, sadly. <laughs> But reflecting on what you have achieved and, and also knowing that that is a past and, and you, you're living in this space of the present between sort of memory and imagination, mm. which, you know, neither of really exist either side of it. I know. Well, sometimes that is a bit worrying. I think that I spend most of my time living in my actual head rather than living in the moment. But then but then I do think writers do live in the moment because, as, as I just said, you are watching and listening and observing and I mean it's quite interesting there are two different types of writers there's some who really like being in their shed and uh and what they don't ever want to do is come out of their shed and so then they come when they're launching a book they sort of come sort of blinking into the into the daylight and aren't very good with people they are because they spend so much time in their head I'm not one of those people I have, at the end of the day, I have to get out. I have to see people. I have to create a, rea- a new reality because I've been living in an alternative universe for most of the day. So uh, I think um, I'm, I'm not one of those people that, uh, that shies away. So yes, I do like to create. I do like to stick. I do like to ground myself at the end of the day in, uh, with real life conversation. So real life conversations, grounding yourself, what's what's the sort of the joy that you find in your in your daily life? Oh, probably having a glass of wine in the evening with my husband. <laughs> Talking to my children when they're not being too annoying. Yes, I mean that that is that is the but 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 the, it has to have been earned. So uh I if I haven't had a good day writing, then I don't really want the glass of wine because the, you know there's nothing to reward. But if you've done a good day, you've done your 2,000 words and you're happy with them and then you're allowed your glass of wine with your husband. The Graham Greene approach. It is, absolutely. Although his was a martini. I think I think that might be a little bit too punchy on a Tuesday. <laughs> with fewer words as well. Exactly. <laughs> yes, I think he was a genius though. So, uh, you know, those 500 are worth 1,000 or 2,000 of anyone else's. Do you have any other models or, or idols that you wor- not worship, but sort of celebrate in, in the literary world? Well, I mean, if you're asking me to advise anyone who wants to be a writer, obviously the, you've got to read. And one of the things that I used to do, I haven't done it for a bit actually, what I used to do all the time was I have, when I'm reading, is I always have, always have a pen with me and uh, I would underline anything that I thought was really brilliant or that I really enjoyed or that that tickled me or made me laugh. And, you know, one of the best writers for that is someone, is Scott Fitzgerald. I think he's a very economical writer. I mean, Gatsby is is a very, very short book. I think it's only about 75 pages long. And it's, but it's it's almost like a novella, actually. But it is the most, one of the most perfectly formed books and he's very tight with his prose but yes yeah all the Russian writers obviously are you know Dostoevsky one of my favorites but I did that's what I used to do all the time would sit when I was reading and just underline things that I liked and then you find that you steal them obviously (laughs) you put them in your great big suitcase and think I might bring that out later that's a good turn of phrase I might borrow that I love I love that you've got a great big suitcase in your head. It's fabulous. I can, <laughs> I can picture it clearly. And just from a, a side, I just want to know what you must have studied all of these Russian authors in their own language as well. Is there a big difference between the translations? Oh, I love you for saying that, Amy. My Russian is terrible. Yes, I did. The, do you know what we did? Poetry, uh, Pushkin much better in the original. But I can't pretend that I've read War and Peace in Russian. I just can't. I'd love to be able to lie and say, yes, I have. No, I didn't. I read it in English and then painstakingly with the Russian translation, underlined the Russian and then learnt the Russian phrases off by heart for my exam. That's how bad I was. Um, But actually, to be honest with you, even the best Russian speakers, I think, would find it hard to read something like War and Peace in, uh, in Russian. Yeah, there is a difference. There is there is a difference, and I think it, you know, particularly with poetry, 
that's by far the most difficult thing to translate. But, um, you know, yes, there is a bit of a difference, but I mean, not substantial. Have your books been translated into Russian? They have. And, and I went to, God, it was the best moment of my entire life. I went back to Russia uh, as an author. Can you imagine? As an author. And I had a book launch uh, for Fashion Babylon in Moscow. And I did a radio interview on, I've got I what it was called now, whether it was Ra- Radio Russia or something, which I think goes to 150 million people. And I did the interview in Russian. And I thought, if my teacher could see me now, this would be like, I mean, you know, I could, I could put my high heels on and have a glass of champagne. Uh, it was the best, best moment. It was like all my worlds colliding at once. And I had a poster on the Metro. <laughs> How exciting. Oh, that's fabulous. Well, that's when you know you've made it when you've got yeah. a big poster. In. A big poster. I've actually still got it here in my office. It's all rolled up. It's huge, huge. I mean, there's, you know, I'm never going to own a house big enough to put that in, but it's, uh, I've got it somewhere gathering dust. And no doubt, you know, some child of mine will be forced to look at it for about five minutes and I go, hmm, so what? But yeah, I do have a proper poster in Russian <laughs> with my name on it. <laughs> Love it. So how would people get in touch with you? What is it that you're are you advocating to go read? What else would you advocate and how would they get in touch with you? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, yes, on my Twitter. And I do run this thing called the Great Big Book Club, uh, which I founded, which was I set up for writers during lockdown when they were trying to, when all the events were cancelled and all these beautiful books were being published and nobody knew they were being published. So I did set up this website, but there is a, a brilliant Twitter called The Great Big Book Club, and we give books away for free. So if you want some free books, we do competitions and things. I've got a poetry book next week coming out on that. And uh, yes, so that's where I am. Fabulous. So we'll point everyone to that in the show notes. And do you have some final words for us? It's been fabulous chatting, but it's come to the end. And I just want to ask you, what words of wisdom would you advocate or share with the audience today? I think being keen and cheap, maybe. (laughs) I think, depending on how old you are, obviously. And also, if you want to write a book, just actually write it. Stop faffing around with the tweaking the first 5,000 words, because that's what we all do. And it always ends up, oh, I've got a chapter. So if you want to do it, set yourself a daily word count. It doesn't have to be very big and just do it. And then at the end, you've got something that you can finesse because the finessing is the fun bit. But if you really want to write a book, write one. Thank you for listening to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave me a five-star Apple podcast review. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook and become a member of my inspiring, uplifting and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. I help people to focus on their why with clarity, uniting their passion with their purpose with a plan to create the life they truly desire. If you would like me to help you focus on your why, then please book a free 20 minute coaching call via candidly.com forward slash Amy Rowlandson. And if you haven't already, please sign up for the Friday Focus weekly newsletter via my website, amyrowlandson.com. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.